have a lot of similarities in how we started out. So I started as a first grade teacher in the mid 90s. And I did not know what I needed to know to be a first grade teacher. But maybe something that's similar to other teachers out there and maybe yourself is I didn't even know that I didn't know what I needed to teach reading. I knew that I hadn't really had a lot of courses in it, but I didn't know about all of this science of reading that was out there. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about your experiences when you started in the classroom and kind of your journey from that initial point. Sure. Well, my first foray into a formal classroom was in South Carolina. I worked in a place called Epworth Children's Home, which is basically a K-12 orphanage and a critical care unit counselor, but also an educator. And so these are students who really don't have much margin for error and the system has to get it right. And I was stunned at what they did. They used some computer technology called Justin's learning system and some other things to really assess kids and then identify their learning path and support them. But I remember them saying, whatever you do, make sure they know how to read. And I, I, I think when the veneer is stripped away, you know, the, the comfort zone that everything's okay and this and that, when you know kids have to have something, to undergird them because society hasn't offered them a buffer. You hone in on what's essential. And that experience at Epworth really crystallized that for me. They're like, look, whatever we do here, our kids don't have the luxury. They need to know how to read. And so we just made sure that they did. And that was my formative experience in the classroom, my first experience in the classroom. And I'll never forget that. And I've taken that with me in different settings, Department of Juvenile Justice, in South Carolina and also um, in Oakland as a teacher and a principal in a variety of other roles. I agree that idea of if they learn nothing else, they need to learn to read. And so did you feel like you had been prepared to teach them to read in your undergraduate work? My undergraduate work did not teach me how to teach kids how to read. That wasn't it. What I did was I followed in the footsteps of a woman named Marva Collins, who is a legend in the Black community particularly. And her story in Chicago was popularized by a movie. I encourage everyone to go watch that movie. You can watch it for free now. But it really talked about how she took kids who were struggling and she worked with them and she taught them how to read and they did great things. And they, you know, it was, it was a glamorized type movie, but the nuts and bolts of it, it was a true story. And she wrote a book and I studied her and I was like, oh, I can do that. It wasn't called the science of reading back then. There was no moniker for it. There was no hashtag or anything else. It was simply called good teaching. She started at the beginning. She went step by step in a systematic, direct, and explicit way. She didn't skip anything, and she worked with all kids, all kids, whether their parents had a cushion for, you know, private tutoring on the side or people who, you know, weren't doing so well in life. She worked with all kids in all ethnic groups. And she got them to read. And so she was lauded in the black communities, particularly. And so that was where I studied. I studied just her writings. She used to give conferences around the country. She did trainings with educators. So that's where I learned to teach people how to read. That was it. And also, when I was in Morehouse College, we had a program called Students for the Children of Incarcerated Parents. And we realized that, you know, we wanted to facilitate communication between the students and their parents. The communication was tough because they'd write these letters and the parents couldn't read them. And it was a stunning imposition. We didn't expect that. With all of our wonderful aspirations and hopes and all that and all the good we thought we were doing, we found that it was even more stressful for the parents at times when that was the case. The child would write them a, a long letter and, you know, if their heart felt and they just couldn't access it. So they would either have to pay someone or negotiate to get someone else to read the letter. It just was a mess. And we realized, oh, my gosh, we have this wonderful initiative. But if the kids parents aren't able to read, there's another layer of complexity that we have to account for. And so I, I took all that into consideration. And so when I came into the classroom, I was ready to go. And thank goodness, because when I got into Oakland, whew, you know, at that time, mid 90s, it was, it, it was a problem. Literacy wasn't going very well, and the cycle seems to repeat itself. But I applied those lessons that I had in my earlier education and experiences as an educator 
to my contacts in Oakland. And thank goodness I had those to fall back on. 